Universal Studios, make some noise! How you guys doing tonight? I want to welcome all the Harry Potter fans in the house tonight. We've got an exciting evening planned for all of you out there. Some of your favorite Harry Potter stars are right here in this room. That's right, I thought you'd like that. But first, before we get started, I see a lot of you are representing your houses right now. Make some noise if you're Gryffindor out in the house. Where's my Ravenclaws? What about Hufflepuff? Now I know we got some Slytherin out there. Now we got a lot of wizards in the house tonight, but do we have any muggles out there? Anybody? Representing way, way back. All right, now like I said, we have a very magical evening planned for you guys. You know what? Let's go ahead and start this show off with a quick look back at some of the stuff that's come from the Harry Potter movies, some of the amazing stuff, from the best-selling books to the award-winning movies to the immersive theme parks that you're actually in right now. Let's go ahead and take a look at that right now.
journey it's been so far? I mean, that was like looking at a thin sieve of Harry Potter's memories, am I right? So I'll tell you what, let's get this party started right now. We're going to start at the very beginning, the Harry Potter books. Now, what was the first book that came out? That's right, can you believe that it has been 15 years since that book came out? 15 years, and you know what? During the anniversary, we actually decided, Scholastic decided they were going to re-release the books with a brand new cover art. And our next guest is actually the one who did all that. It's the one and only Kazoo Kibuishi. Now, Kazoo is an Eisner-nominated artist and author and a longtime Harry Potter fan who was recently chosen by Scholastic to reimagine the covers of all seven Harry Potter books. Now, as you can see right back there, each of the covers depicts a distinct and memorable moment from the respective book that they're a part of. And he also designed the back covers and the spines so they could put them together in a box set, which is really awesome. Now, Kazoo said the opportunity was more than a little surreal. I want you guys to put your hands together and make some noise for the one and only Kazoo Kimoishi! See you, brother. Have a seat right there. You guys excited? <laughs> no, because we were glad to have you here, man. How's it been so far? Great. Yeah, cartoonists don't usually get to do this. That's true. You're usually behind the scenes. This is, yeah, I'm usually hiding out somewhere in the back. So it's going to be different not using your hands on this. <laughs> all right, well, we got a few questions to ask, and I'm sure all of you guys out there want to know some of this stuff. Now, I got to ask you it's kind of it's a big deal getting to do the cover art for the books, especially redoing them after they've been out, and you've got the fans out there who know the stories inside and out, know everything about it. What was your reaction when Scholastic, hey, we want you to do this? How did you react? Well, when I was initially asked to do it, I actually, um, I was really hesitant because I, I liked the original covers so much that I didn't feel that um, anybody should touch them. <laughs> and. But, but when, I, when I thought about it, I realized that it had been a while, and the readers of uh, my book series, The Amulet, were actually too young to have read the books back when they came out. And I realized, oh, hey, this is a, this is a great opportunity to introduce the books to a new generation of readers, because um, it's been with us for so long. And, um, and so then I you know, submitted uh, some copies of, of what, I, what I would do, and they, they chose them. And, uh, I'm, to be honest, yeah, when, when I was told I got it, I, I did just quietly in my chair, just go, yeah, did a little bit. Yes! yes! And then I was like, oh face. man, that's a, this is going to be a lot of responsibility. <laughs> so it quickly like, went from being, yeah, to, oh no. And uh, everyone's going to hate me. Uh, you guys love like, the rights? <laughs> Exact opposites. Now I gotta ask you. Now we're talking about those. Where did you, where did you get the inspiration for that? Like, you're talking about the fans and how the books have already been there. It's gotta be a huge responsibility to come up with different inspirations for each of those books. How did you choose the cover that you chose? All right. So here's a crazy story. I um, I actually got sick and I was in a coma around the time they made the selection for the uh, the cover the cover art. Um, and I was recovering, and I had, uh, I had short-term memory loss, you know, so if I read something, I would just forget it. But my long-term memory stayed with me, and I still remembered having read the books, and the books had an indelible, um, indelible impression on me, just as it has on all the generation of readers that have read it. Um, and those memories were strong enough that I just remembered a few moments, a few key moments from the book, and that's what I ended up illustrating. Um, so luckily, my long-term memory didn't go away. And and did you get your phone call before or after the coma? Oh, no, that was afterwards, yeah. <laughs> so it was like, yeah. Yeah, I was asked to submit, I was asked to submit the sketches uh, before, and then I came out of the hospital and I forgot everything. And I was just, I, did, I had to teach myself to draw again, I had to teach how to, myself how to walk. I couldn't even remember what shoes I was wearing. So or what, you worked what, on these afterwards after you retired yourself? Yeah, I was, I was actually working on these while I was uh, recovering. Um, from from the uh, the event, but 
I was actually any of that, and I can't draw like that. <laughs> but, uh, but the That's drawing skills didn't go away. The, all the long-term stuff still st stayed with me, and the editors and everybody were really great at, you know, um, helping me with any of the details if I had them wrong. But I didn't actually get too many details wrong, and so, you know, it actually ended up being kind of a, a good thing that that I had to rely on on that on that strong, I had to key in on those strong emotional Specific memories moments. that I had that had just been buried in my brain so deep that I wouldn't forget them. And so, um, as an author, as an illustrator, I always feel like my job is actually to, to uh, illustrate and to tell stories um, that become memories. So this became a perfect uh, exercise to do something like that, to create new memories. That's great. From old ones. No, you were you were saying earlier that you were worried when I mean, you were excited when you found out, but then you were also yeah. worried about the reaction when you redid the covers. How's the fan response been to it so far? Oh, the fan response has been uh, so positive. I I'm just I'm really uh, I'm really lucky. Well, I'm lucky because the fan base <laughs> is so great. You know, I'm I'm working I'm working with um, a fan base that is so accepting and so they're so excited about uh, about Harry Potter and the world. I just, I felt like, um, you know, everyone sort of brought me into the fold very quickly, and I felt at home. Now, did you feel any certain pressure when working on the covers of Focus on the Story, or were you influenced more by the, the popularity of Harry Potter? Well, I tried to, to stay away from a lot of the, the, the popular interpretations of, um, of the series. Those, those aren't going to leave our minds. I know everyone had those. Uh, in, in, at the back of their minds, um, because I was, I had this feeling that I was supposed to introduce the books to readers who had never read the books before. I mean, it's kind of crazy to think that there's some people who haven't read them, you know. But when they're, but my the readers of my books, I they were hands. Hands. <laughs> uh, Who's read the books? <laughs> who hasn't? Who hasn't read the books? <laughs> Yeah, so I, I sort of I saw it as a, a way to introduce these adventures to new readers, and especially to the young readers who were um, just starting to read, learn, learning to read through the books that I normally do. Uh, I knew that it would it takes a lot to get someone to be interested in a series, and it's 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 going to take more than somebody just saying, "Hey, that's a good book." Right. And so I wanted to show um, a snapshot, like a window uh, of the world uh, that they'd be experiencing. And I, I figured it, it doesn't matter if you know the stories or not. You could look at that and go, that looks interesting. I want to dive into that world. And that's the way I ended up, um, that's the approach that I took when I illustrated the covers. No, I mean, it, it definitely translates. So I don't know, how many of you guys out there read the book for the first time with these new covers, with the re-release? Anybody? You guys read them all from the beginning. <laughs> they just came out. <laughs> Did you guys go back and get the re-release? Hey. Thanks, guys. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Well, Kazu, that's all the time we've got right now. Um, it's been great having you. Now, I hear you're going to be around the expo, am I right? Doing some yeah. signings? Oh, yeah. I'll be at the event, and I'll be signing uh, signing at the table, I think. Excellent. Well, I think so. We look forward to seeing you there, Kazu. Thanks for coming out yeah, here, man. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks give it up one more me. time for Kazu Kiyomishi. I'll take that. You can, I mean, you can take it with you if you want. <laughs> Just take them all. It's fine. <laughs> Give it up one more time! Now, I'll tell you what, let's do a little trivia right now. How many of you guys know that Professor McGonagall was almost sort of in a Ravenclaw? Raise your hand, let me see. Clearly all my Ravenclaws out there. What about uh, Phileas Fitwick? Did you know that he was almost sort of in a Gryffindor? Anybody? They're like, no, nah, no. Nah. How many of you guys are on Pottermore? Well, see, that's the thing. You wouldn't know that from the films or even the books, but if you visited Pottermore.com, you'd know that both teachers were hat stalls when they tried the sorting hats. Now, how many of you guys have been sorted on Pottermore? Were you happy with your sort? Good. Now, the sorting ceremony on Pottermore.com was actually devised by J.K. Rowling herself, and it's the only place to get officially sorted. So if you haven't done it yet, make sure you check that out. But you know what? We're going to do some house pride right now. I want you guys yelling out your houses on the count of three as loud as you possibly can. Here we go. One, two, three. Woo! One more time. All right. You guys ready to meet a few of the Harry Potter cast members? 
Yeah, I thought you'd say that. All right, let's get this party started. Ladies, get ready. From awkward and unlucky to brave and heroic. Since his first fumbling days of Hogwarts was last heroic stand against evil. Played by our next guest, Neville Longbottom, one of our hearts. Maybe the hearts of a special Ravenclaw. As Harry Potter's friend and Double Door Army member, please welcome to the panel, Matthew Lewis! We're still going. Now for precocious pranksters and entertaining entrepreneurs, we follow these two since Harry's first day in Hogwarts. They play the comedic cornerstone of the Weasley family, Red and Forge. I mean, Fred and George Weasley. Please help me welcome to the stage, James and Oliver. Still going, there's more. Now we first met her in Harry Potter, the Order of the Phoenix. As a quirky, quality Ravenclaw, Luna Lovegood. Her real life Harry Potter knowledge could certainly rival any of the fans in this room. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Ivana Lynch! For his explosive presence in the series, he lit up the screen for us as Harry's fellow Gryffindor bunkmate, Seamus Finnegan. Please welcome to the stage, Devin Murray! He's an Order of the Phoenix member. He's a Ministry of Magic employee. Electric plug collector. These are just some of the terms one can use to describe our next guest on screen character, Arthur Weasley. But it's safe to say that his performance made everyone wish they were part of the Weasley family. Please join together in welcoming Mark Williams to the stage. I'm glad you're here. How's your day been so far? Pretty good? A little cold for Florida? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now, we know we have the best Harry Potter fans in the house, am I right? So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna, we're gonna do some trivia. We're gonna ask you guys some questions based on some of our favorite clips starring you guys. What do you guys think about that? We're gonna show some clips. We're gonna ask you questions about those. We're actually gonna start with you, Matt. You're up first. Are you guys okay with that? Just making sure. Matt, let's go and take a look at your clip. Doesn't matter that Harry's gone. Stand down, Neville. People die every day. Friends. Family. Yeah. We lost Harry tonight. He's still with us. And here, so spread. Remus, Tonks, all of them. They didn't die in vain. But you will, because you're wrong. Harry's heart did beat for us, for all of us. Sword with you. 
no, no, they don't give me it. I tried. I'm going to be the first thing. All right, so we got we've got five questions based on just random questions that we got around. And the first one is, how are you feeling when you read that you would personally destroy Nagini? And what was it like to see that scene fully realized? Like when you were from the difference from when you read it and when you actually were there. Yeah. Uh, wow. Um, I remember uh, reading the book uh, very vividly and uh, getting to that section of the story and just thinking, "Wow, that is going to be incredible!" I and mean, what a responsibility that, that you know that Joe Rowling has has yeah, laid, you know, you know, on me there. So. Uh, yeah. What was it? What did you do? I don't think J.K. Rowling wrote the limping, did you? <laughs> uh, I think I just got injured playing football or something like the week before. I had to just, just write it in myself. Um, but there's like, there's like four stages. So like you read it in the book, and then you think, is it going to be in the, in the script? Uh, are we ever even going to film it? And then finally, is it going to make the, the, the final cut? And um, thankfully, I. It got through all four of those stages, and um, yeah, it was incredible. I never, I never expected anything like that to um, to happen to Neville. So it was, um, it was pretty special. It was um, a really nice moment for. It's a very for full me. circle moment for you. Yeah, exactly. You know, it really, it's, it's the culmination of, of his, his entire journey. It's, um, it's, it's Neville's moment, and um, it was, it was really great. I'm so glad that David took the time to, to really nail that that scene. It's great scene. Now, I gotta tell you, I mean, even just when you came out from your picture there and seen you there, obviously. Your character did a lot of growing up. <laughs> now I'm gonna ask you, what was it like growing up on the set? Um, wow. I mean, it was it was such a laugh. Like everyone had such a good time um, together on on those films. Uh, we sort of lived like two lives, like our lives back home where we lived, and then this ridiculous life where we we made. Harry Potter films for for a living, and we did all our school in there, uh, like together in the same classrooms, and it was a real family atmosphere. Everyone <laughs> <laughs> with one of our one of our teachers over there, and getting to work with him. <laughs> Apart from when you were all about fourteen and fifteen, where you used to sit off set on your blackberries and stuff, just going like, <laughs> you go hello, hiya, and you'd all go. Oh, <laughs> I still do that now. Sure, it's even worse than that. All right, I'm gonna ask you. Now in the books you became a herbology professor. If you had a choice, which Hogwarts class would you teach? Not that one, you. Um, well, it's, it's gotta be Defense Against the Dark Arts, isn't it? That's, like, that's the best class. Like, that's, that's the class that I'd most like to attend. And um, I think like, Professor Lupin was like my favorite teacher. So, um, so I think, yeah, yeah, Defense of the Dark Arts, definitely. Excellent. Now, uh, what was your first scene that you filmed, and what was the last scene you filmed in the movie? Oh, jeez. Um, <laughs> think back, think no. back. Um, oh, no, okay, yeah. yeah the, first film I, uh, the first scene I did was, um, was when Neville got on the broomstick in the very first movie, and it all went wrong and flew around. And I was, like, you know, 11 years old, absolutely terrified, and... Um, Chris Columbus sort of took me aside and went, uh, no pressure. Uh, so, uh, cheers, Chris. You're like, thanks. Uh, so awesome. that was um, that was a sort of in at the deep end start for me. But it was great, you know, doing all those kinds of stunts when you're 11 years old, like being on a roller coaster. It was it was so much fun. And then um, my final scene was was all that kind of stuff. And, uh, okay. and the uh, the actual final final scene that I did was on was on the courtyard. And um, I remember, um, well, you, you were there. Everyone else was there. Um, too soon. Um, but yeah, that was it. It was, it was a great finish, you know, for, for to do that scene last. Um, for you know that, that that whole moment for Neville and to, to go out on that high was was really cool. That's awesome. Now, last question. Now the scene where. <laughs> Neville did the Snape and grandmother clothes bogger. Can you tell us what your bogger would actually be? Um, I don't know. Uh, I'm pretty, I'm pretty scared of spiders. Like, what, 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 like I know it's, I know it's kind of, a, it's kind of a cliche, but it's, it's not. Uh, <laughs> the single most terrifying thing on the earth. 
Um, they just uh, there's times in my house because I live in quite a, an old house, um, and there's like, lots of little like little holes and, and, and dark places where they can hide, and they. Uh, They've trapped me in my kitchen for hours before. Like, just, I've been there. And they, you know, they smell fear. They, they can, they know. Do you know those photos online where it shows like the person like, oh gosh, a spider, and then all of a sudden it shows a house blowing up, and it's like all good? That's, that's, that's it. Yeah. That's it, yeah. <laughs> I've got you know, baseball bat, samurai sword. I'll get anything I can, I can just grab to try and take care of it, but um, they terrify me, man. Do you have a samurai sword in your house? Come on. <laughs> It just doesn't have the other one. It's just a samurai. <laughs> all right, Matthew. That's that's all the questions I got for you right now. James, you're next. Let's go and take a look at your clip. We did it to two just this morning. It's what goes to work. Oh yeah, and why is that green, Jeff? You see this? This is an age line. Dumbledore drew it himself. So? So, a genius like Dumbledore couldn't possibly be fooled by a dog as pathetically dim-witted as an aging person. Yeah, that's why it's so brilliant. Because it's so pathetically dim-witted. <laughs> Ready, Fred? Ready, George? Bottom, sir. pretty much a typical scene for you guys. <laughs> now I'm gonna ask you, now Fred and George were, were known to be notorious pranksters in the movies. Did you pull any pranks of your own during the films? A couple, yes. What, what was your favorites? Some we can't say for legal reasons. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's the ones you can. <laughs> Those <we> can. <laughs> um, I can't, actually one we did on Matt once, um, I don't know if you can remember it or not. We, Matt fell asleep in front of the TV in one of the dressing rooms, which we just happened to be playing Battlefield on. It's like a computer uh, game where you shoot people. <laughs> so we turned the volume up to 100% and fired a, a few rounds off. <laughs> it's quite entertaining. It was like this. Now, what was your reaction when you read the when you were reading the script and you found out about Fred in the final book? He already called him out. He was already out there. Before I answer this, this is a spoiler alert for anyone who's not seen or read the last one. <laughs> I actually that day they're like, you're not gonna be in it anymore. Yeah, exactly. Well, I actually uh, when I first read it, I was in Japan. I was doing some traveling. I was on the bullet train, and I, re I literally read what happened to Fred, uh, and I was a bit like, oh, like, without getting too dramatic or anything, it was like reading that your best friend had been, had been killed. It was quite a, a surreal moment, which that feeling surprised me even more than reading what it was. It was so I think that's only when you realize how much it means that someone. So I'm kind of a bit somber, I'm like, oh, wow. As I'm doing that, the ticket inspector came round. He, I don't speak Japanese, he didn't speak English, but I was trying to like, I've just died here, excuse me a moment. He's like, ticket! It was ticket, ticket, I'm dead, dead. I don't understand. <laughs> you can get your ticket later. Now, we know that Harry Potter has the most dedicated fans out of any film series out there. Now, do you have any very memorable moments with the fans throughout this entire thing. What was your most memorable moment? There's been so many, I've got to be honest, uh, so, so many from, from the... She's like, us! Oh, yeah, well, I was getting to that. <laughs> from, cut him off, he was going there. So I remember the, the first scene we did, we were in... Um, <laughs> I just saw my head there. <laughs> <laughs> Those are, pretty, those are pretty good from out there. Yeah, um, yeah I know you're just multiplying. <laughs> I, I remember the, 
the final premiere that we that we had in Leicester Square in London that was apparently the biggest premiere in history, which we thought, you know, that one nothing like this will ever be seen. And then we came here for the grand opening a few years ago. Um, yeah, I mean, some of you guys may have been there. Um, um, oh, Mega Con! Oh, there they go. Um, so, well, Mega Con was more recent. That was more recent. We I just took photos yeah. with you, remember? So, yeah, so Oliver and I um, were doing press in the morning. So we were there before sunrise. And you could see like a little silhouette. And then as the sun came up, you just saw the people get further and further and further. And I think it was about three or four miles stretch. So, uh, I mean, if people say, like, what the fan base to, I mean, and also the, um, the fans are very respectful of our own privacy as well, which is, is really great. And um, just everyone's very friendly and very supportive. So thank you so much, guys. Really good. Nicely done. Now I'm going to know. Working on the films, which of the directors influenced you the most? Yeah, thanks. <laughs> they, um, they all have, to be honest with you. I mean, anyway. Chris Columbus gave us our big break straight away. Um, Alfonso kind of um, got us really into, into the characters, even so much so in the Marauders map scene. Um, he, he kind of helped the characters kind of cut each other up and really flow with each other, develop. And then Mike Newell was just a hell of a, a good guy to work with, very funny. Um, he allowed me to keep my long hair, as you saw in that movie. <laughs> and, um, yeah, and then David, for the, for the last couple, he again really got you on the emotional side of the character. So I think I can't really answer just one particular director, they've all no, been it's fantastic. That's great. Uh, last question. Uh, this was actually a Harry Potter question, so I gotta know if you could cast any spell, which one would it be? Think about it. <laughs> it's not really a spell, it's just something that's in it, uh, and it would be a port key. Like, I'm sure you guys will have been stuck at immigration in this country, right? It takes ages. So. And the flight as well, so I mean, then I could just pop back and forth as much as I want. There you go. I like it, James. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oliver, you're up next. Let's see your clip. Switch places on set. Did you ever? Did you ever switch places and and try to do each other's scenes to mess with everybody? Uh, it's a really boring answer, but no. <laughs> um, in the uh, I can remember. In the, I think it's the Chamber of Secrets on a long grey horse shoot in a rehearsal. We may have done thinking, oh, are we naughty? <laughs> um, you, you couldn't tell the difference. The only time we actually had to to swap over was because uh, James uh, came down with a. With, with the cold when we were filming, and uh, I was in Chamber of Secrets as well. And Harry's leaving um, a homework session, and as he's leaving, and everyone thinks he's the um, the air is slithering at the time, so people are talking behind his back. And in the reversal shot, I was sitting next to James, uh, but for the, for the flip side, um, James wasn't there, so my double was where I was, and I had to move where James was. So if you pause it, you can see. There's only one switch here. Just for just a little bit. That, that, that was the only time. That's close enough. That's good. I like that. Now, what was your favorite scene in the film? In, in, in any in, in any of the films. films. You um, choose any they, one. Pretty, I mean, that, that scene we just saw there was pretty cool because I just thought, what a, you know, what a, <laughs> what a horrible, horrible brother to do that. <laughs> um, but I'm sure everyone would do that. But also, also the, uh, the World Cup scene as well, when we did that, I was... That was really cool. 
Um, I think because we could just be ourselves at a football game, you know, shouting, come on, and you know, yeah, really getting into it. That was um, fun as well, because it was, it was really like, you know, dad taking the sons to see the sports teams play, so it was a uh, really good time. Yeah. Didn't mean to interrupt us. The flying was great though, wasn't it? You remember that day when we had that on the, uh, yeah, we, we, with the Kirby oh, one flying, and they, they, and it's stunt guys on great big steel drums binding you like this. <laughs> and there's two, there's two sets of drums, the drums to take you up and the drums to take, and it was, it was the length, it's back to those lights behind there. And they, they wind us up and then whap! I liked it. <laughs> That's actually good, because you know what? The Quidditch scenes were awesome. What was it like when you were filming them, and, and was there any cool moments that happened? Um, I mean, the main thing with Quidditch is that how, again, like how the films evolved, so did the filming of Quidditch. Um, even to the, f the point where you'd, we'd start filming on the first film, and it would be a small little bicycle saddle on the broomstick. And then by the end of it, it was this huge, almost like a horse riding saddle. Um, so it became a lot more comfortable. Um, but actually filming it was, uh, it would be on a, a large track, and you could be anywhere from, you know, a couple of feet to quite high off the ground, and just go, Go for it all around there, and there were some uh, there were some cool cool parts from that Quidditch sequence. Um, but I mean, I think it's more interesting watching it than it was filming it because after a while it did get a bit repetitive and everything else. But it was still cool. I mean, everyone wants to fly, right? So it was the nearest one. Can't beat that, man. Now, if you were given the chance to avoid traffic, say you're on the way here, there's too many cars. You're like, listen, I need another option. Would you choose the Nimbus 2000? Apparition or the Flying Ford Anglia? Which one would you choose? Um, I wouldn't choose a Ford Anglia. Um, <laughs> mainly because when we're filming Ford Anglia. Anglia. <laughs> <laughs> no, but for the main reason that when we were filming, we had we had Hegrick in the back with us, and it all looks cute and everything, but owls go to the toilet quite often. <laughs> And it was this, the hottest day of the year. Experience. Yeah, yeah, and this and this this owl had obviously eaten quite a lot. Um, <laughs> he was flapping his wings, so the whole back of the car was just covered in bird nests. Did, did it did it get you? Um, it it may may have been, yeah. <laughs> another reason I wouldn't get in a Ford Angler again. Um, but yeah, so I'll probably go for the Nimbus 2000. Was it a 2000 or 2001? You know what? Maybe, maybe 2001? Maybe 2000. 2000? I mean, the Fireball would have been better, I think. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so a broomstick, I think, because you could, uh, you could go a lot, a lot quicker and it's easy to park as well. Yeah, it's just you. you don't worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> now, I gotta know, what would your Patronus be if you had to choose one? Um, oh gosh, I don't know. It'd be just you. Just me, Oliver, or me? Just you, Oliver. Um, you say he's a brother? <laughs> you say I'm scary, is that yeah. <laughs> um, it would probably be like a panda. <laughs> yeah, just like, well, like obviously it. like obviously like uh, Harry has always a big stack. I'm a bit chilled back like that, so it'd probably just be just a kind of sit there and just like, like sitting there with a bamboo stick. Dementors go down. everywhere, and he's just... Not like super intimidating, but just there, like you yeah, know, and then, there, just, and then like every now and then you do it and he'll just be asleep. <laughs> no, get up and do this, come on! <laughs> all right, all right, that's all I got for you, man. Thanks. Ivana. Let's go ahead and take a look at your clip. Now we've heard that you had a really unique casting experience 
for the movies. Can you share any of that story with us? Uh, yeah, well, that was, I mean, I would never be where I am today if I hadn't been a huge Harry Potter fan to start with. I think everyone knows that. I don't make it a secret. <laughs> but yeah, I used to, I really, really wanted to play that part. I just, because I read, um, I started reading them when I was eight, and I knew about Luna's character, and I knew she was coming up, and I was keeping an eye. <laughs> I was like a big fan of the films already. So I used to go on all the Harry Potter websites, MuggleNet, I should give them a shout out. <laughs> I used to go on MuggleNet every day uh, just for news, and uh, one day there was an announcement for an open casting for Luna. I was like, that's me, that's my ticket. So, um, and I, I lived in Ireland, I'm, I'm from Ireland, and uh, it was in London, so I kind of had to beg my parents, and my mom didn't want me to go because I had school, and my dad, who's here, hi dad, um, he, he, he took me, he said, oh, let's give it a shot, and uh, yeah, so it was, it was a big open audition, basically anyone could go. Uh, there was How many people do you think were there? What? How many people do you think were at that open audition? Well, they said 15,000, but that's a scary number. I think, I don't know. Um, yeah, they said that. And then apparently three boys turned up to the end. Fair play. <laughs> these guys? Yeah, these two in wigs. Um, yeah, and I had that, it, it was on a, a Saturday. It was actually January, and Dad actually, he, he does that every January. If he, Well, he's here, so he didn't do it this time, but he sends me a text and he goes, six years ago to this day, and he'll give the whole story. <laughs> um, and the moral of that story is, is make sure you got a good dad. <laughs> Spoken by a good one. Yeah. And then, yeah, and then a week later I had a screen test, and that was it. It happened really fast. It happened within two weeks. Now, did you, did you go back and be like, Dad, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yes, yes I did. Um, definitely paid off. out of it too. We, we, he always says that we were walking around, uh, we went to the NASA Space Center the other day, and he still does this, he turns around, because we get into places now, Harry Potter just opens doors, he turns around, he's like, he hasn't done well we landed that part. He just, <laughs> so, he, he's doing okay. <laughs> now, you have a very special connection with your own character, but other than Luna, which character is your favorite? Oh, hmm, that's a good question. Um, probably Dumbledore. I... Albus, I like it. He, yeah, he's just wise and quirky and has great dress sense. And <laughs> I, yeah, I just always took a lot. Everything, every time he comes into the books or like the, the scene, like in book and movie, you just kind of go, oh, it's gonna be okay now, Dumbledore's here. <laughs> Except until book six. Book six ruined it, but, um, <laughs> I don't know, he always made me feel safe and I trusted him. Yeah. Now, you said you were a fan, you were never in the movies. If you weren't acting in the films, would you have wanted to work on the production any other way, like directing or props or anything? Like, what would that be? Um, actually, I did, when, when I was, because we were all in school at the time and uh, in my fourth year of school we had to do work experience in other places and I mean I was working on the Harry Potter films, kind of the coolest place to do work experience so I just, I, I contacted people I went to, I worked at the makeup department and in the costume department and, uh, and the art department but I think I enjoyed the costume most because it was so much fun and it, it, it just felt very, like it, it was a big part in creating the characters as well, definitely like for Luna, I wouldn't feel f fully Luna until I put on my horseradishes and the whole shebang, you know. Fully so, character. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it felt very creative and, and cool. Now, knowing that you had such a huge knowledge of the books beforehand, was there anything that was in the books that you would have loved to have seen made into the movie that didn't make it in? To any oh, of them. so many things. Um, I was gutted that they cut out Dumbledore's funeral. I actually like marched up to the producer's office and I was like, you can have my paycheck. If it's money, just take it. Because I mean, like, I mean, they gave Dobby a good send off. I just felt it was, I mean, it broke my heart that he didn't get a funeral. Um, but we gave him a wand tribute. It's 
not the same, but still. Um, and then I was really sad. Personally, I was sad that I didn't get to do the Quidditch match commentating. Because uh, it was so cool. And it was in there at first, and we had the line out and everything, and it just it got cut. Um, but yeah, because I was never one in matches, even though it was Quidditch, I kind of not off a bit. I don't find it that interesting, and like, oh, they would make it. Sorry, all So it was games. just like football. Sorry. <laughs> I, yeah, but I liked how she commented. Very nice. Now, speaking of changes from the pages of screen, now we've talked about Luna and Neville's relationship during the Deathly Hollows. Now, as a fan of the books, how did you feel about that? Do you think that Luna and Neville would have made a good couple? Yeah, that was, a, that was funny, wasn't it? Matt, you can, you can respond to this too. <laughs> Be very careful how you answer this. <laughs> And I'm, I was always aware of the fan world, the fan fiction world, that same world. Um, because I think it was one of those things that people always thought of and they kind of wanted it to happen. But normally when you change something from the books, change something in the movies from, from the books, people get very mad. They just like, they don't like it. It's not canon. It shouldn't be there. But this was one that actually everyone was really happy with. And I think it's just like, it's they're both outsiders. They're both kind of, they're, they're weird and proud about it. And um, it, it just was nice, and it also kind of fit in the context of the war, uh, because everyone gets married then, because they don't know if they're going to live or die, and that was cute. But I also, like that moment at the end of the film where they both go, it's a bit awkward, it's like, mm. I, <laughs> personally, I think, I think too, Luna's too weird for Neville. Um, <laughs> but, but do you think that JK couldn't resist matchmaking with her creations, you know? I think that it's towards the end of it, she just she couldn't help it. This one, this here, this one, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like knitting. She was like a mom, like matching everybody together at that point. <laughs> it, was quite, it was quite nice that I think it was, um, you know, to see those journeys uh, as well, you know, Come so far from when we first see them to, to when we, we you know we see them in, in the Deathly Hallows Part Two. You know, just that that, that one scene we just saw there. Um, you know, Ivana's um, sort of introduction to to Harry Potter. Um, the, all the looks that sort of Neville gives her, he just thinks she's the weirdest person of all time. Um, and yet, by Deathly Hallows Part Two, you know, he's he's like crazy for her. So it's like it's. Um, I just really like that that whole journey, even if it wasn't canon. I quite like the way it is. Um, after it was all decided and the film was made, I don't know, because I'm weird, I still put Harry Potter posters up in my room, but there's, I had the fifth one in my room, one day I was looking at it and I was like, hang on, they're just totally checking Neville out, if you look at it, everyone else is looking really determined at the camera, and they're just like, <laughs> check them out. It happens. <laughs> Listen, I'm like... I'm still doing it now. <laughs> He's getting a little cold down there. He's not feeling any of the heat. <laughs> if all of that's all the questions I have for you, thank you very much. <laughs> Devin, you staying warm down there? <laughs> oh, you got hand warmers. I have my hand warmers. I'm sorry. Totally forget what you thought you needed those in Florida, huh? <laughs> Yeah, but let's go and take a look at your clip. I am Robert Harfrey Holm. Turn this water into rum. I am Robert Harfrey Holm. What's she was trying to do to that glass of water? Turn it to rum? I am Robert she managed to win tea yesterday. Before... <laughs> Thank you. Nothing's changed. Nothing has changed. Oh man, that's a great. I, I actually, I've seen it now like four or five times. Every time I'm like, yeah. yeah. I still haven't mastered that spell. I keep trying. Still. To no. We gotta work on that. We'll work on that later. <laughs> now you started working on the Harry Potter films when you were really young. What was your casting process like for the film? My casting process was actually kind of funny. Because, as most people know, I am dyslexic and I didn't read Harry Potter before my audition. So I get a phone call off my agent saying, okay, hey, you've got to go for an audition over in the UK. So I'm thinking, sweet. So they say you're going over to meet Harry Potter. So I was like, fine, great. 
So we flew over and I got to meet... When I went over it was like, okay, so uh, this is Harry Potter, cool. And all of a sudden I come over and the director comes over, so I say, hi Harry, how are you? Yeah. And everybody's like, uh, what are you talking about? This is Chris Columbus, the director. I'm like, oh, my bad. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I actually, I met Matthew Lewis there on the, the same day, I think. You were going for the audition as well for Neville. So, uh, yeah, I went there, I done the screen test, and literally two days later, I found out that I had the part at the read through which wow. was pretty cool. That's a pretty quick trip around that. Yeah, it was deadly. And you hear you are from that? I stay on strong. Just there you go. It's <laughs> all the way to be, man. Now we know that Seamus, the character, loves to blow things up. We also heard that you held kind of a rather awesome achievement for breaking the most prop wands. <laughs> How did that happen? And, and do you think you're similar to your character, Seamus, in any way? Okay, well, the wands. That's all Matthew Lewis's fault again. <laughs> Because in the first Harry Potter film, uh, Neville comes in and he has the leg locker curse. And Seamus goes over and he's like, Neville, I can sort that out for you. And Neville's like, hang on there. What was, what was the line? If I let you do it, you'll blow my bloody kneecaps up or something. And Seamus gets really, really angry. So he gets his wand and he slams it on the table, says something to Neville and then storms off. But every time I slammed the wand on the table, I broke it because they were made like, they were like really thin, so yeah. <laughs> Typical me. I only broke one wand. Only one? I broke like 20 in one day. <laughs> doing that. But coming back to being like Seamus in real life, I'm definitely like Seamus. I'm clumsy. I blew up my uh, microwave twice. <laughs> my most Still recent. Still stuff up. That's good. <laughs> my most recent was in June. So, uh, yeah, like I still haven't learned. How, how? I think that's what it is. I do miss it, of course. But to be fair, I don't actually go in there and put, like, something metal in it. And the ball is like, I'm not that stupid. I swear. The first time there was something metal in it. The second time there wasn't. I learned. It's a good lesson to learn. Now, speaking of all the explosions, you've had a lot of them in your face. <laughs> What was that like? What was it like having all those explosions in your face? Uh -huh. It was kind of, it was kind of cool. It was an experience. Uh, I just see Matthew Lewis in the way, the way, and he's going to set me off. But uh, yeah, like it was, it was really cool. I was my very first. The explosion was on the first movie. And everybody else is giggling and setting me off. Cheers. Uh, yeah, it was on the very first one, and it was with uh, Professor Flitwick. And it was on my 13th birthday. And I'd done it, and it was great. What they'd done is they had to use, like, special bulbs. And they were, like, the old-fashioned cameras that had one flash. So they used, like, 20 or 30 uh, bulbs to get the light and the explosion. So that was cool. The problem was, because they had so many and the power going into them was insane, they kept on actually blowing up. So the actual glass was smashing and flying everywhere. So that was kind of, you're kind of dodging all the shards of glass. But James has blown up quite a few things. He, I think he had three proper explosions over the course of the movies. And you're still doing the microwave and everything. Still the microwaves. <laughs> We're just keeping the tradition going. Now, now in the films, your characters generally seem to hang out with other characters from your same house. Now, did you feel a sense of loyalty to your fellow Gryffindor classmates? On set, uh, it was kind of everybody was just all oh, best mates, you know? You, you wouldn't say, oh, I'm not going to hang out with Tom, Jamie, or anyone like that because they're in Slytherin. So, no, but uh, when you're filming, of course, like, Seamus wouldn't have probably... No, actually, no, I think in the movie, I always thought that Seamus should have been an undercover spy for Slytherin. <laughs> yeah, I, I always thought that. I always thought Seamus should have run back to like Draco Malfoy and tell him, come here, this is what they're all doing over here. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's just something that I always thought from the very beginning. Sorry? He's yeah, he's Irish. Over there by himself. <laughs> What's that? 
It's all coming out now, blowing up Slytherin's microwaves and all sorts of <laughs> That's it. They kick them out after the first week. After three microwaves, you're done. Now, leading into that, your character, Seamus, was Gryffindor. You, what would your house be? Uh, for me, it would probably be Slytherin. <laughs> Definitely. Like, I'm ambitious, so in everything I do, like, I'm, I want to be do it the best. And I think that's very much like Slytherin. As far as I'm aware, I, they are like, that's one of their things, isn't it? Like, <laughs> yes. See? I do know stuff. Ivan is just looking at me saying his research. Yeah. <laughs> Devin, that is all the questions I have for you. Thank you very much, man. Mark. It's your turn, man. Let's check out your clip. And who are you? Oh, sorry, sir. I'm Harry, sir. Harry Potter. Good lord. Are you really? Oh. Ron's told us all about you, of course. When did he get here? This morning. Your sons flew that enchanted car of yours to Surrey and back last night. Did you really? How'd it go? Oh, I mean, that was very wrong indeed, boys. Very wrong of you. Now, Harry, you must know all about muggles. Tell me, what exactly is the function of a rubber duck? Mark, how was your trip in, man? How, how was your trip in? Oh, yeah, what? Here, on the aeroplane. Yes. Marvellous. It's <laughs> wonderful. You can see out and everything. <laughs> Clouds and they bring you cups of tea. <laughs> no, well, the best thing about it is your phone's not on, so people aren't ringing you going, could you just... Can I just... <laughs> so that was me. <laughs> now i got to ask you, the Weasleys are definitely fan favorites, the family for sure. Now what was it like playing the patriarch of the family? Did you find yourself giving fatherly advice on and off the screen? Um, well, it was, well. <laughs> uh, when we were doing Goblet of Fire, everybody was in, and you were all really young, and it was it was a laugh. So mostly it was like, shut up. <laughs> Ginny, uh, Bonnie just used to bounce around. <laughs> and and uh, yeah, <laughs> and there's a lot of snigger in there. <laughs> so uh, it was a lot of fun. I said until they all the adolescents when he was just like, okay. James and Oliver, did, did you feel like you guys got any good advice off screen? Yeah. <laughs> yeah we, we did actually. On the, uh, on the last film, I came in. Yeah, I found a great curry house down the road. So we, 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 we went out for a curry, didn't we? In the, uh, he's, he's one of this like, outside of filming, um, like hanging out because we were all in the. In the that the same that was when the, we were in this. Part, we went. We went for a pint when they were old enough. We went for a pint and a curry. <laughs> just to clarify. No, they were. It was a sort of rite of passage, you know. And we were in this. Um, and this this girl said, "Oh, can, um, can we get a photo?" And so the, the boys and um, the twins with with the with um, groups in between them, and then they said, "Oh yeah, and your dad." <laughs> <laughs> I think we're very happy to have you in that photo <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> now, we've got a Twitter question for you, Mark. Uh, you are pretty much the dad that anybody would love to have. Are you like Mr. Weasley in real life? Uh, tragically, yes. <laughs> In what way? Um, I'd sort of tend towards enthusiasm as the first choice option. That's my default option. Brilliant! Uh, and um, sort of nosy, really. 
I mean, what is the function of a rubber duck? Well, amusement, clearly. Employment for rubber duck makers. Everybody needs a job. Uh, you know, uh, yellow paint testing. I don't know. All of those things are great. Flotation technology. I'll show up now, Austin. Now, if you were one of the students, which character would you like to play? That's a very difficult question. Um, I I wouldn't answer that really because I think of all of all the students as a sort of as a uh, uncle patriarchal figure. I could see fantastic things in all of them, you know. And, and I used to love watching them do stuff. <laughs> At one point, when um, when Neville walks out from the from the, the lines in the last battle, and <laughs> And Shane just goes, stand down, Neville! <laughs> <laughs> that was just engraved on my memory, I love that. And, and my daughter does a great impersonation of, of Luna going, there now it goes, Harry. <laughs> and so it's all a, a great big rich mixture of, of great amusing young people's stuff. <laughs> Right. Now, do you have any favorite magical artifacts? Any if, magical artifacts? Um, yeah, I do. The clock. Uh, which I, it just is a, it was a, just a whole image for me of the quality and care and, and um, uh, excitement of being on a set like that where the clock had got hands that were actually the, the finger pieces from scissors they went round with a picture of each of the family in them and uh, you knew where they were the great one was in mortal peril <laughs> oh quick <laughs> what's the oh mortal peril <laughs> all right last question <laughs> Now, your character would be the coolest between me and Julie, actually, though. <laughs> Peggy, pop up here! We're just going to do that throughout the night randomly now. Like, I just want you to pop up and say that. Throughout the entire night. Doesn't matter what's happening. Pop up here! Nailed it. <laughs> now, we know your character worked in the Ministry of Magic. What would your wizard job be? Like, if you could get a wizarding job, what would it, it be? What, if he does what, do, what yours, mean, though. If, not, not your character, yours. If, if I didn't, if he didn't, I don't know, mate, you confuse me now. <laughs> Faintly, I suspect. Austin, you, sorry, you have to spell that out. I'm just here to confuse you, that's yeah, what I'm here. <laughs> Are you saying, if I wasn't in the Ministry of Magic, what would I do? No, your character oh, worked in the Ministry of Magic, but you, if you oh, were so what, then, what would your wizarding job be? Well, oh, you're not interested in me, are you? <laughs> I think probably I'd like to be a, oh no, we've got owls, haven't we? I was going to say a postman. <laughs> Just bimbling around, you know, like, hey, you go. Oh, go home now, have a cup of tea. <laughs> Mark. You guys have all been great. That is my last question. Or do you guys have any last things to say before? Yeah, um, a big thanks to everyone waiting out in the cold here. Yeah, uh, yeah I, 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 it's great to be back. And I say that very sincerely. We flew in today and it was like, oh, brilliant. Back here. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I know there's got messages on Twitter, you guys have been out, some of you have been out since like 6 a.m. So, yeah. Honestly, we, we do really mean Thank you so much for your support and for being here today. I hope you have a great weekend and yeah, cheers. I, uh, I, don't, I don't know how much more I can add on, on, the, on the bottom of that, but you know, as the years roll by, you always think, 
Oh, I'm going to cut one of these things and there's going to be no one here. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking at uh, all you people and it's, uh, it's, it's still pretty special. So thank you so much for coming out. Appreciate it. Thank you. And I want to say thanks for everything over the last, say, 14 years of my life. Everyone has been, has been great, all the support. And just thanks to me for trying out for this. And hope to see us all over the weekend. Said. It's, it's so lovely to come back here. Um, I'm this, uh, what Matt said, I keep expecting people to be like, who are you again? Get out. <laughs> and it's really nice just to be welcomed back every single time. It does make it like feel like Harry Potter is a family and, and that you're part of the family, which is so nice. And uh, I also wanted to say thank you to Warner Brothers and Universal for having us all back all the time. Yes, thank you guys for joining us tonight. Now we know everybody, you guys want to ask some questions, right? Well, don't forget this weekend you're going to have your chance at the Toon Amphitheater at Islands of Adventure, so make sure you're there to go see it. You guys are all going to be there, right? Excellent. Now, I know you guys probably caught the announcement about Diagon Alley, am I right? Well, if you didn't get a chance to take a look at it, exciting stuff happening here and to share some more information on it we have Michael Dokey who is the senior show producer for Universal Creative and Alan Gilmore who is supervising art director and design consultant for the Wizarding World of Harry Potter Diagon Alley please put your hands together and welcome them to the stage <laughs> gentlemen thanks for joining us this evening now uh, have a seat right there have a seat now, what information can you share with us regarding the new expansion? Now we can't hear you. Hold on. Try it. Try it again. All right, hang on. Let's switch around. I'll stay. You, you broke it already. Try this one. Did you blow it up? Did you blow it up? <laughs> is, is this one working? Fantastic. Uh, I'm I'm so excited for all of you. Um, there are so many fantastic details in this new land for you to see. Um, uh, it's coming soon. It's coming soon. But, Man, but I can guarantee you, questions. that Alan will agree that once you pass that threshold uh, and you enter Diagon Alley, there is magic on every street that you can interact with, that you will see, that will completely amaze you. Uh, this we know, and it's kind of funny. We, we we are working in the land, and we're seeing all of this come together, and we're trying to figure out okay, which element are they going to be most excited about? And uh, it's it's all fantastic. I guarantee you will be amazed. Alan? Great. is great. The Diagon Alley is going to be absolutely amazing. You are going to love it. My personal favorite, um, and you've seen some pictures here, is Gringotts Bank. When you walk into that space, it's majestic. Uh, the marble columns, the uh, glass ceilings, uh, the detail that is prevalent throughout this bank is amazing. And there are other surprises that uh, await you as well, but uh, uh, we can't wait for you to experience it, as well as the magic uh, throughout the land. Look, we want to know what time of day. You guys excited about the opening? I think they're ready. We saw that. Now, now, James and Oliver, you guys have got to be excited about opening up your store. Weezes, wizard, weasels, weezes. Sorry, say that ten times fast. Now we have uh, some cool stuff actually behind you that we're gonna, we're gonna talk about. Some first time ever we're revealing these products. Uh, we're gonna talk you guys through them right now. I think we have the decoy detonator up first. Now, uh, when you need a diversion, just drop one of these and we'll run off, create a loud bang, a terrible smell and some black smoke. That is definitely the decoy detonator. Next we have the umbrage on the unicycle. 
<laughs> which is on a prominent display at the Wheezy's Wizard Wheezes. This miniature Dolores Umbridge on unicycle travels aimlessly about spouting, spouting useless information just like Dolores herself. And last we have this nose-biting teacup. Tired of your friends stealing your tea? Serve them one of these. That'll stop that real quick. Now, I understand, James and Oliver, we have some snack boxes you guys are going to talk us through. Yeah, can I start and say they won't make you sick <laughs> unless you play a lot and then go on the forbidden journey or process <laughs> <laughs> and then eat some more. Yeah, yeah it's, it's kind of what every, whenever we speak to anybody about the, uh, the Weasley's Whistling Weasley's Joke Shop, they always say, I wish I could have a snack box. Not necessarily for, well, probably for getting out of school and stuff, but also to actually have a sky and snack box. And as you can see, they're pretty, pretty authentic looking. Um, so I can't, I can't wait since I'm strangely intrigued what the puking pasties taste like. <laughs> also, these, these were, especially mine, but maybe Oliver as well, these were our favourite props from the whole movie. So um, when, when we learned earlier that these were, were going to be available, we got very excited. It would be nice to see them actually in hand. Actually edible. Yeah, that's what I'm looking forward to. Very nice. Now, so you haven't tried any of these yet? No, you haven't, no. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have them here. <laughs> We're gonna have to make that happen. We're gonna have to get you guys in there and let us know what you think of them when they come out here. Are you guys excited about the snack boxes? I thought so. Well, you know what? Here's what we want to do. We want to we want to open up some more questions right now. Uh, if I don't actually have a question for you, uh, what do you think about the guests being able to experience the Hogwarts Express? Now we saw you on there. You got to go through there. You got to see something that nobody out here has seen. What are your thoughts? Um, I think definitely like the park it needed this because it's it's first time I came here like obviously being going to Hogsmeade was amazing but I I almost felt like I wasn't emotionally prepared for it I was like whoa suddenly we're in Hogsmeade you know and you, you come from the land of Sinbad and it's like what is going on so it's a bit it's a bit jarring and uh, I think having the Hogwarts Express it kind of takes you out of the Muggle world like the way it did for Harry. And then, to, and then just, like, I, I know, like, this was how it was for me, and it will be for these guys hearing the screams, that you just, like, get very excited, and, like, that, that will help, I don't know, just bridge that gap between Yamaha World and Wizard World. And it really helps you immerse yourself in it, that you believe you're here, you know. We're all very excited about that. Now, we actually had some fans submit some questions through social media. We're going to ask those right now. And, and the first, oh, I thought we were done. <laughs> now, i got to ask you guys, what is your role with the Wizarding World of Harry Potter? Uh, I'll start. Um, my role is to represent the, um, the film design team, the film production team, to help Universal bring this story to life and create this immersive environment and create this most amazing environment that's never been seen before in the theme park world. Um, in Hogsmeade and Hogwarts, we... We succeeded in creating a beautiful place, but I believe in Diagon Alley we have surpassed that level of detail and you guys are going to so love it. It's absolutely incredible. I can't wait for you to see it. And he's done an amazing job. And my job is to make sure that Universal delivers the intent that has been created by Stuart Craig and delivered by Alan. And I can certainly say, and I, and I hope that Ellen agrees with me, that we are going to surpass, you know, everyone's expectation. We are, we're really, really excited. You guys have come here this weekend. Um, we're very close to completing this project, and we are really, really excited about how it's coming together. It's, it's beyond anything out there. You are absolutely going to love it. Now, what can guests expect from the listening world of Harry Potter Diagon Alley? That's, uh, that's a loaded question, because there's, there's a lot that I can reveal, and, and a lot I can't, but... Uh, <laughs> like, we won't tell anybody! What, what I, it's what I promise, just between us! What I promise is that on every street corner, or well, on every street, there will be magic. Uh, magic that you will uh, participate in, and magic that you will observe. It's, it's fantastic. These are full-size... This is a city that you're walking in. 
And uh, there, there are streets and mysteries and magic on every street corner, and you're going to be amazed. When you pass from London through to Diagon Alley, you will be absolutely immersed. There's nothing else, but you're in the world of Harry and his family and his friends and the, the, the wizards. You are absolutely and utterly immersed. It's, it's, it's fantastic. Now we're going to ask, what was the creative process like to bring the Wizarding World of Harry Potter Diagon Alley about? Um, well, it's, it starts with, with the script. It starts with the story, and that it starts with J.K. And uh, then the visuals are translated by Stuart Craig, and uh, directed and, and given to us by Alan. And our team at Universal uh, translates these illustrative drawings and concepts into uh, structures that can be built. And they have to be built to represent what you see in the films, what you know as Diagon Alley and these iconic figures. And uh, that's part of my job, is to make sure that we fulfill that dream and that promise to bring to you the reality that you see in those films. And I think we've done an excellent job. Yeah. I think they would agree. All right, thank you, Alan Michael. Now we got some questions for you guys. <laughs> I'll actually throw this out to any of you. You can choose who answers this. It doesn't have to be all of you. You can pick one. Uh, how does it feel to see the Harry Potter films that you worked on come to life at the Wizarding World of Harry Potter? It's awesome because, like, I remember walking onto the sets for the first time and everyone expected me to be really overall, and I was, but I was also like, Where's the castle? I, like, I thought that it was a castle within a studio and it was kept super secret, but no, all the rooms were disconnected. Chessboard was broken and taken apart. It was actually kind of heartbreaking. So coming here, like, yes, this is how it's supposed to be. They put it together, finally. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it, it, it's totally new for us, like walking, even the, the, like the Diagon Alley is, is a new part. Walking from London into Diagon Alley, like that is a special experience. For, it was for Harry, and I think it will be for every single person who goes through the park. So. <laughs> All right, well, this is going to be our last question. I'm going to give this to all of you, so I'll start with you, Matthew. What item would you most want to buy in Diagon Alley? Um, I, I fear that I'm about to steal something off you two here. Um, but the, <laughs> but you've just absolutely, your little pitch back there, of, um, you've inspired, I, I want some Skyrim snack boxes. They're absolutely, uh, you know, it's the sort of things like, because the film's finished so long ago, um, just seeing them up there and reading the names just took me back to reading the books, and I just remember it all. Uh, so that was pretty cool. So yeah, I think I think I'd like to get to Weasley Wizard Weezes and pick some of them up. <laughs> Sorry if that was what you were going to buy as well. He's coming up with another one now. Yeah, he's, thanks, man. Uh, <laughs> you could say the same thing. I'm gonna I'm gonna go a bit side of it. Uh, I heard a you know who. That'd be quite fun, yeah. So, well, that's uh, a bit sad. I just have no idea. Ivana, so, why is it you know who? You created it! What are you talking about? I know, but I was trying to explain it to Matt and I couldn't. <laughs> I don't want to. <laughs> Thank you very much. Right, yeah, so that. Uh, the constipation sensation that's gripping the nation, is that what you just said? Okay, so James wants one of those. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I think I, I'm going to have to go with Matt, a star of Snapbox, but specifically for the Puking Bastards. A magic cat? Um, <laughs> I find cats pretty great already, so... A magic one would be like ten times cool. I can't think of anything better. Uh, I'm liking the, uh, the snack box for, uh, from the Wheezies as well, that's pretty cool. But I'm you, sorry it's nothing what, great. What do you think you would eat first out of it? Uh, the puke and pastels. I just gotta try it. Yeah. It's with the explosions. It's, it works out. <laughs> it could be the wrong explosion. <laughs> <laughs> what if you had a puke and pasty and then a you know food? Would that be... <laughs> What's 
stuff. Is that an idea? <laughs> I'm going to make that happen. Yeah, yeah. So we'll, we'll, we can test this up because the other one. Well, that's a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> See, we got somebody to do it already. Yeah, it's perfect. <laughs> all right, guys, that is all the time we have for questions tonight. I want to thank all of our special guests for joining us on the stage. See you guys throughout the entire weekend. Now remember, we got a whole lot of activities planned out here. Starting with the Harry Potter Expo, open to game tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., which is followed by our first Q&A session at Two Lagoon Amphitheater at Islands Adventure at 10 a.m. I want to see everybody there. You guys going? All right, on behalf of myself, ladies and gentlemen, give it up one more time for all of our special guests. Thank you very much.